Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. I've got my Hamilton 1800 shirt on today, so it's time to talk a little bit about Alexander Hamilton and his place in history. Specifically, we are gonna take a look at the feud probably most responsible for the two-party system we have in the United States. This is the channel Weird History. We've done a few reactions of theirs in the past, and they have a video about the feud between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton is deeper than you thought. So we're going to, as always, dive into this one with the original content linked in the description below. If you like this video and you like the style of this channel, I encourage you to go check them out and support them by watching a bunch more of their videos, giving them a subscription. But let's go ahead and dive into this story. The first political rivalry in U.S. history was between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. But their beef went far beyond their political differences. And in the end, both men would destroy their own reputations in order to attack each other. Today, we're going to take a look at how the beef between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton was worse than you thought. So I will say this off the bat, I'm not sure it's the first political rivalry in American history, but it's the first significant political rivalry, right? Uh, there's always been rivalry. There are always going to be differences of opinions. There were strong differences of opinion when it came to the Constitution itself, which predates the beef that these two guys have with each other, right? Because while the Constitution's being written, Alexander Hamilton is at the convention. Thomas Jefferson's in France as the U.S. ambassador. So they're not even in the same, uh, same continent at that time. So there are beefs, there are rivalries happening, but this happens between the two probably most influential members of Washington's cabinet, and it fractures the uh, political landscape in a significant way. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other presidential topics you would like to hear about. Okay, time to throw on the original cast recording of Hamilton. When George Washington became America's first president in 1789, he appointed both Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson to serve in his cabinet. Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury and Jefferson as Secretary of State. So Washington's experience with both of these men goes back a long way. Obviously Washington and Jefferson are both part of the Virginia delegation to the Continental Congress that is going to uh, adopt the Declaration of Independence. Washington. Uh, of course, by that point, has been sent to uh, take command of the army uh, in Massachusetts. And then later on, he's in New York at the time of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so they know each other from Virginia. They know each other as men who are both of the mindset of independence, of confronting this problem with uh, Britain head on. Washington and uh, Hamilton are first going to meet when Hamilton is a captain commanding artillery in Washington's army and his mind, his ability to write, uh, his super intelligence uh, is going to come to uh, the attention of a number of people in Washington's army and eventually Washington's going to get Hamilton on his staff and make him kind of the de facto chief of staff. Uh, so he shows a great deal of trust in this young 19, 20 year old that he's put on his staff. This probably seemed like a good idea at the time since both Hamilton and Jefferson had a close relationship with Washington. But we've all had those friends who just don't get along. So maybe Washington should have seen the pair's legendary feud coming. Maybe if he wasn't so busy chopping down cherry trees with his wooden teeth. That's how the story goes, right? Yeah, none of which is true, of course. But uh, so you have to, in Washington's defense, Jefferson has been out of the country for years. Uh, he has spent most of the time uh, from the early days of the revolution up through uh, to the Constitution serving in a variety of capacities. He serves as governor of Virginia for a little while. Um, you know, so they haven't had a lot of interaction. And Jefferson is coming into this. He basically shows up uh, having come back from his role as ambassador to France. He, he shows up back in the U.S. right about the time that the revolution's breaking out in France. And he shows up to news that he has already been nominated to be Secretary of State and approved by the Senate uh, before he's even had a chance to say yes or no to that. Uh, so I don't know that there's any way for Washington to have known how Jefferson was going to feel about this. But Jefferson's very much a states rights guy. He's very much in favor of a weak central government. Hamilton could not be more opposite. And I think 
Washington is more of Hamilton's mindset on this, which is why he defers to Hamilton so often. Hamilton was only 22 when he served as Washington's secretary during the American Revolution, and they remained close for years after the war ended. In fact, it was Hamilton who encouraged a reluctant Washington to run for president. Jefferson shared a similar background to Washington. Both were Virginia planters and both distinguished themselves during the revolution. Jefferson by penning the Declaration of Independence. Fun fact, if you've ever looked at this painting, if you look, you can't see it in this image, but if you look down at the bottom, you'll see that Thomas Jefferson is stomping on John Adams' toes in this image. Uh, now there's obviously there's no, this image that is portrayed here never actually happened because all of those men were not there at one time when the declaration was presented and when it was adopted and when it was signed. Uh, men were kind of coming and going, things like that. And Washington by winning the war. Also, both men married widows named Martha, and we all know the power of a shared Martha. I make you a promise. Martha won't die tonight. Sadly, the three men did not quite form the dream team Washington probably hoped for. Hamilton and Jefferson both saw themselves as Washington's closest advisor, which sparked a rivalry. The two began to compete for Washington's approval, and that competition would eventually turn the rivalry into an all-out feud. Now, maybe I'm wrong about this, and somebody with maybe more insight than I have can speak to it, but I never got the sense that Jefferson was trying to compete for Washington's approval. Um, or Hamilton, for that matter. I think Hamilton had Washington's approval. I think Hamilton already understood that he was trusted by, by Washington. Now, he wasn't Washington's first choice for Secretary of the Treasury, but Washington's first choice turned it down and suggested Hamilton. And I think it was a good choice. But Hamilton's a very ambitious guy who's got big ideas and is going to push for those big ideas. It was a real mean girl situation. Hamilton and Jefferson may have run in similar circles, but they were very different men. Yeah. Hamilton was from the Caribbean, born the illegitimate son of a Scottish peddler. In 1772, he moved to New York City. And now, I've done a complete video already about Hamilton's story, so I won't kind of recount all of that now, but it's fair to point out that the only reason Hamilton's born illegitimate is because his mother had been previously married to a guy who was really just not very good to her, and she finally left him but the way the laws were at the time where they lived she couldn't get a divorce without his consent and he wasn't willing to give it and so when she meets James Hamilton they wanted to be married but they were unable to be married because she couldn't get a divorce uh, so she has two children with James Hamilton Alexander's one of them and uh, then James Hamilton basically leaves she dies of illness when Alexander's just a kid uh, and he basically becomes an orphan and has to kind of pull himself up. And the Big Apple turned Hamilton into a proponent of urban commerce. He saw America's cities and its merchant economy as the economic engine that would drive progress. And he believed a strong central government was necessary for the country's survival. Yeah. Jefferson, however, was more of a farm boy. These guys epitomize the the very divide that is going to define the first hundred years or so of America, and in some cases even longer. But the difference between central government uh, and money and the cities and the agrarian society with a weak uh, central government that, where the power is more in the states, uh, the north-south divide, all of those things that are going to define the early years of this country are epitomized by these two. In his eyes, Hamilton was advocating a return to European-style monarchy. He was. The thing they I mean, just... That's fair to say. He was called a monarchist, and he advocated for, uh, for hereditary titles and for lifetime positions. And uh, it was a fair argument that he was being called a monarchist. I don't know that he was necessarily for monarchy itself, though I don't think Hamilton would have had a problem with George Washington being made a monarch in America. Just fought a whole ass war to get away from. Jefferson's perspective favored a decentralized government, which he believed would allow for more personal liberty. Both men thought they could sway Washington toward their vision for America. Early in Washington's presidency, the generals seemed to side with Hamilton more than with Jefferson. To say Jefferson took it personally would be an understatement. And can I just take a moment and point out how awesome David Morse was in the role of George Washington and John Adams, which is what you see here. And Paul Giamatti is John Adams for 
uh, as well. And uh, I forget the name of the actor, but the guy who uh, played Stannis Baratheon in Game of Thrones, um, who Stephen Delane, uh, who plays Jefferson and, and Adams, uh, Jefferson and John Adams, all fantastic casting choices, really. Jefferson was convinced that Hamilton was a corrupt, self-interested monarchist. He was. And in 1792, he complained to Washington that Hamilton had a squadron devoted to the nod of the treasury. According to Jefferson, these men wanted to form the most corrupt government on earth, which sounds like hyperbole, but Jefferson apparently really believed it. Jefferson believed any uh, consolidation of federal power was gonna lead to corruption. Uh, and, and to be fair, Hamilton's Treasury Department was by far the biggest part of the government, right? He had hundreds of employees in the Treasury Department. The War Department under uh, Henry Knox has like a couple of employees. That's it. Uh, and so Hamilton did very much use his influence with Washington to grow the Treasury in significant ways. Washington tried to cool the friction between his two BFFs. In a letter to Jefferson in August 1792, Washington wrote, How unfortunate, and how much is to be regretted then, that whilst we are encompassed on all sides with avowed enemies and insidious friends, that internal dissension should be harrowing and tearing our vitals. Essentially, Washington was saying, Squash this beef, I've got real problems to worry about. But Jefferson didn't get the hint. Instead, he wrote back to Washington and doubled down, declaring that Hamilton's ideas flowed from principles adverse to liberty and were calculated to undermine and demolish the Republic. In short, Jefferson was accusing Hamilton of being a traitor. So, one of the things that Hamilton does that really irritates Jefferson, but Jefferson ends up being complicit in, uh, is what we call the dinner table compromise. It's portrayed in the musical Hamilton in the song, The Room Where It Happens, right? Jefferson and Hamilton come up with this compromise where because Hamilton wants to help establish America's credit and get America off to a good start financially. And the way he proposes to do that is to take all of the debts that the states have accumulated from the uh, Revolutionary War and have the U.S. government start a national bank, take on all of that debt. And so now, since the states owe money to the federal government, now other nations are more willing to lend money to the federal government. It's establishing credit. But as Jefferson sees it, and rightfully so, the U.S. government taking on that debt and making the states owe that money to the government means necessarily that the government's going to have more authority. Um, and so he saw that as corruption. He saw that as taking on authority that the government shouldn't have. But he makes this agreement in order to get the votes in Congress to make it happen by getting Hamilton to get his folks to side with Jefferson and other Virginians on putting the new federal capital near to Virginia. So Jefferson's going to be close to home instead of having to go all the way to New York or Philadelphia. It's rarely a good idea to be perceived as the dangerously unhinged guy in the office. But Jefferson refused to let go of the idea that Hamilton was a traitor. And speaking of Jefferson's accusations that Hamilton was using the government in corrupt ways, Jefferson puts a guy on his payroll at the State Department as a translator. But what the guy's real job was, uh, was to uh, head up a newspaper whose job it was to trash Hamilton and his allies in the press. It doesn't get more corrupt than that. In October of 1792, Jefferson even told Washington that Hamilton was heading a monarchist plot to seize the government. Jefferson claimed that Hamilton had told him that the Constitution was a shilly-shally thing of mere milk and water, which could not last and was only good as a step to something better. Shilly shally. Them's fighting words, Jefferson. In response, Washington, who was apparently done humoring his increasingly venomous pal, dismissed Jefferson's claims as ridiculous. The president then added that Hamilton's plans actually worked and were already bringing financial stability to the new country. But rather than back down, Jefferson concluded that the 62-year-old Washington's brain had been enfeebled by age. And here's the thing, and, and listen, I, I acknowledge up front I have a natural bias against Jefferson. I am not at all a fan of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, 
D Declaration of Independence is a brilliant document, and I give him all the credit in the world for writing the vast majority of that. It was a committee of five, but he's the main author. Brilliant stuff, but not a fan of Jefferson and the way he went about things. The man was Secretary of State, okay? His job was foreign policy. It was not his job to tell Washington how to do what he was doing uh, in terms of uh, the financial system and all that stuff. That was Hamilton's area of responsibility, but I get it. This is the first uh, president in history. This is the first cabinet in history. Everybody's feeling out their roles. Everybody's figuring out what their place is and what it's not. And Jefferson, no doubt, saw his role as an advisor to the president in all areas. Hamilton held sway in Washington's cabinet, but things changed with the election of 1796, in which Jefferson won himself a spot as John Adams' vice president. Sensing that Jefferson's pettiness would only get worse now that he was VP, Hamilton marshaled the Federalists, his political allies in Congress, to oppose Jefferson's Republican Party. In 1798, Hamilton's Federalists passed the now notorious Alien and Sedition Acts. So Hamilton and Jefferson both resign eventually from Washington's cabinet. Uh, and so by the end of Washington's second term, neither one of them are even in those roles. Hamilton has gone back to private life as a lawyer because he was losing a ton of money. He was not corrupt. He wasn't stealing from the government. Hamilton uh, wasn't doing most of the things Jefferson was accusing him of. Uh, but he wasn't making a lot of money in his role as Secretary of the Treasury. So he go, goes back to private life. Jefferson does the same, but he does the same because he's already thinking about running for president when Washington's uh, time in office is up. And so he runs against Adams. A couple other guys run. Adams wins the election. Jefferson, as the runner-up in electoral votes, becomes the vice president. They're going to run against each other again four years later. The Alien and Sedition Acts are terrible. I don't know how much you put that at Hamilton's feet, though, because Hamilton's not in any sort of government role at this time. Does he have influence? Yes. But I just don't see Hamilton as the prime mover behind this, this, these Alien Sedition Acts at all. Which were designed to suppress political dissent. In fact, I should point out that Hamilton and Adams, even though they are both Federalists, hated each other. Jefferson raged against the law, calling it detestable and worthy of an 8th or ninth century. He was right As about that. As for the Federalist government, it was a reign of witches. And Jefferson saw Hamilton as being behind the whole mess. And so at this time, they're typically called Republicans. Later, they're called Democratic Republicans. And this party will become the Democratic Party. Proclaiming him our Bonaparte, a reference to Napoleon, who was busy conquering Europe at the time and may or may not have appreciated the comparison. For what it's worth, modern legal experts widely agree that the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional. <laughs> Though at least part of one of them is still on the books. So why didn't Jefferson challenge the laws in the Supreme Court? Well, because the country was still so young, the court hadn't yet asserted its power of judicial review. True. The Supreme Court wouldn't establish its authority Murray to declare Madison. laws unconstitutional until 1803. In 1791, Hamilton met a woman named Maria Reynolds. The two had an adulterous affair, which was probably a lot of fun for Hamilton until he found himself being blackmailed by Maria's estranged husband, James Reynolds. So the whole thing, if you kind of look at the whole thing, with, and they call her Mariah in the musical Hamilton, but it was Maria, Maria Reynolds. And uh, it was probably all a setup. Um, James Reynolds, her husband, was kind of a con artist. That was what he did. And he was always looking for the next scam, the next scheme. Uh, and this was most likely one of those schemes uh, to try and blackmail Hamilton. So she shows up at his office saying, my husband has uh, abandoned me. He's treating me bad. I need help. Uh, and Hamilton falls right into it, invites her over. They end up having an affair. The affair goes for a month or so. And then James Reynolds shows up and blackmails him and says, unless you want this to get out, you're going to pay me and you're going to pay me a lot. And he keeps demanding money. And eventually Hamilton just says, I'm done. I'm, he ends the affair. He says, I'm not paying you anymore. Reynolds ends up in prison uh, and ends up kind of spouting off about this and saying, hey, I know something about the Secretary of the Treasury. And he starts saying all this. And, and so very early on, it gets out. 
and there are men who know about it, but it doesn't come to anything. And it's only years later after Hamilton's back in private life that all this comes out. Reynolds demanded $1,000, roughly the equivalent of $32,000 today, to keep the relationship secret. Worried that Reynolds would tell his wife about his indiscretions, Hamilton paid the money. But you must regard it as a personal loan. It has nothing to do with the treasury. But he did not end the affair. When James Reynolds was arrested in November 1792 for forgery, he wrote to Hamilton's rivals, promising information that would destroy Hamilton's reputation. Wonder if all that crime had something to do with Maria betting down with Hamilton. James Monroe heard Reynolds' tale and went to Hamilton to get his side of the story. Hamilton privately confessed to the affair, and Monroe agreed to let the matter drop. But Monroe also made a copy of the letters from Maria Reynolds and gave them to Thomas Jefferson. In other words, Hamilton was totally screwed. And Hamilton and Monroe nearly fight a duel. And the guy who talks them down from that duel is Aaron Burr, the guy who will eventually kill Hamilton in a duel. It may be hard to believe, but Jefferson didn't immediately use the letters no, he to didn't. destroy Hamilton. In fact, five long years passed before they would come into play. During that time, the rivalry between Hamilton and Jefferson grew more and more personal. Finally, in 1796, when Jefferson was running for president, Hamilton accused the Virginian of hypocrisy. Hamilton said that while Jefferson might seem like a simple, humble farmer, the Virginian's reputation was a flimsy veil to the internal evidences of aristocratic splendor, sensuality, and epicureanism. Not wrong about any of that, right? Jefferson was this guy who was very much about the aristocratic lifestyle. He spent money as fast as he made it. He always wanted to have the servants around him, and he, he loved that kind of Virginia planter uh, life. And so Hamilton, who grows up in poverty, who has to claw for everything that he gets, sees Jefferson as kind of a waste of a human being because of it. Although it's not entirely clear, it seems possible that Hamilton was referencing the rumors about Jefferson's affair with Sally Hemings, who was not only his slave, but also his deceased wife's half-sister. Yep. What time do you get off work? Um, never. <laughs> Jefferson did not feel like sitting on the letters any longer after that. He turned to his attack dog, muckraking journalist James Callender to finally reveal Hamilton's affair. And Callender's the guy I talked about earlier that he put on the payroll and did these things. And, and Callender, that story's pretty interesting too because eventually uh, James Callender will turn on Jefferson when Jefferson is about to become president. And he's all set to testify in court against Jefferson over some of this stuff. And he ends up drowned in like two feet of water down in Virginia. Uh, under really mysterious circumstances. He kind of got epstein I think. Callender published the story of Hamilton's affair in 1797, and given that he was Jefferson's hand-picked messenger, he did not pull any punches. Callender called James Reynolds a pimp and printed Maria's letters to Hamilton. He also attacked Hamilton's loyalty to his country, writing, so much correspondence could not refer exclusively to wenching. No man of common sense will believe that it did. Hence, it must have implicated some connection still more dishonorable. And this is where they know they've got Hamilton and they're going to incite him to respond, right? It's one thing to accuse him of the affair, which was true. But they're accusing him of corruption and Hamilton's not going to stand for that. And unfortunately, sometimes people who have always been able to talk their way out of a situation, or in Hamilton's case, write his way out of a situation. Uh, and they, they talk about this in the musical Hamilton, right? There's a song called Hurricane, where the whole thing is, every time I've gotten in a difficult situation, I've written my way out of it. I'm going to do it again. Only this time it backfires big times with the Reynolds pamphlet. In other words, nobody would write this many letters to a woman unless they were guilty of corruption. As the scandal blew up, Hamilton decided that his only chance to defend himself was to admit to the affair. He eventually penned a response asserting that his only crime was an amorous connection with Reynolds' wife. Hamilton's admission came as a shock to allies and enemies alike. And so he writes this, it's nearly 100 pages long, and he passes it around to some of his friends who all tell him, don't publish this. The affair was not nearly as big a deal as 
people thought it was, right? It, it wasn't getting huge press around the country. It wasn't this big, big scandal. Hamilton's in private practice by this point. He's not in the government. It, he really would have been, in hindsight, best to just let it go. Just let it go, let it die out, and it would have. It's his response that turns this into a big deal. Imagine what that did to his wife. Imagine what that did to his allies. George Washington's still alive at this point when all this comes out. Imagine how he felt about Hamilton because of this. And it ultimately did little to help his reputation. One New Yorker even told Hamilton, you have widened the breach of dishonor by a confession of the fact. Yep. Once news of Hamilton's affair became public, his reputation was destroyed. Hamilton surely blamed himself for the disaster, but he also blamed James Monroe yep. for copying his love letters and giving them to his greatest rival. If you've ever seen, it's pretty entertaining, the drunk history version of this. Uh, they, they portray this scene, right, where Hamilton confronts Monroe and he's like, listen, there were three people there who knew about this and you were the one who was taking notes. I know it was you. What the hell, James? Furious, Hamilton stormed over to Monroe's house, where he implied that the future president of the United States was a liar. Monroe didn't take the accusation too well and immediately challenged Hamilton to a duel, which Hamilton quickly agreed to. Monroe called on Aaron Burr to serve as his second yep. at the duel. Burr, who would later fatally shoot Hamilton himself in a duel, spent months acting as an intermediary and eventually convinced the men to call the whole thing off. Hey Siri, What's the definition of irony? The Reynolds affair yep. ultimately destroyed Hamilton's hope for any future office. Right, and a lot of people have speculated, would he have possibly run for president? Uh, and I think he probably would have. And there are people who claim that Hamilton could not run for president because he was born in the Caribbean. Uh, absolutely not true. If you look at the Constitution, the Constitution uh, in its provision saying you have to be a natural born citizen, it grandfathers in everybody who is a citizen of the United States at the time the Constitution is adopted. Hamilton absolutely was eligible to run for president of the United States. Um, but yeah, this destroys his any chance of him having a future political career. Um, but again, it's, it's fascinating that Monroe is involved in all this stuff. And um, kind of an interesting side note to all of this, uh, Hamilton's widow, uh, Eliza, who he actually typically referred to as Betsy rather than Eliza. Her name was Elizabeth. She lives in Washington, D.C. for the last years of her life. She lives 50 years after Hamilton dies in 1854. Uh, so she's in her late 90s. And one of the things that would happen is that when somebody would be elected to government to as president of the United States, as a senator or something like that, one of the things you would do when you arrived in Washington is you would pay a courtesy call to Mrs. Hamilton. She was like this last connection to America's founding, to our founding fathers, right? And so these men would show up uh, even into the 1850s to pay a courtesy call to Mrs. Hamilton. And one of the people who does this, uh, and this is years earlier before um, she's an old woman, is James Monroe. And he actually shows up at Hamilton's widow's house and wants to meet with her. And in one of the rare cases where she refuses, she basically sends word back to Monroe, listen, I'll meet with you if you are willing to, to apologize for the way you treated my husband, for the things that you did to undermine his character and to destroy his reputation. Only then will I meet with you. And this was a very Christian woman who believed in forgiveness, but man, she was holding a grudge decades later against Monroe for all of this, and he wouldn't do it. Jefferson, meanwhile, noted just how useful the muckraking calendar had been and decided to use the newspaper men as an attack dog in his campaigns for the presidency. But Jefferson was playing with fire. In 1800, Calendar was arrested for writing a vicious anti-federalist paper and was prosecuted under the same sedition act that Jefferson had already opposed. By the time Calendar got out of jail, Jefferson had been elected president. Calendar expected Jefferson to help him out, but the president just ignored him. So, Calendar retaliated by publishing scandalous stories yep. about Jefferson's affair with Sally Hemings. So there you go. Your attack dog, that's the problem when you hire people like that that are willing to tear people apart, is they will turn on you when you no longer use them. It turns out that the Founding Fathers were basically the messiest clique in high school. In 1804, Aaron Burr whacked Alexander Hamilton in a duel. 
After the event, Thomas Jefferson, in a show of maturity and respect, finally stopped tearing into his old rival. Nah, just kidding. Jefferson kept ripping on Hamilton for years to come. In a private letter dated 1820, Jefferson complained that Hamilton was chained by native partialities to everything English. And Jefferson had a natural aversion to anything English because he's very pro-French. In fact, like to a fault, he was very pro-French to where he was blind to anything that the French did, like the XYZ affair, for example. Uh, he basically just tries to excuse how that happened. He also argued that Hamilton wanted to destroy America's insulation from the abusive governments of the old world. In another piece, Jefferson continued his accusations of corruption by claiming Hamilton was so bewitched and perverted by the British example as to be under thorough conviction that corruption was essential to the government of a nation. Way to stay classy, TJ. So what do you think? Whose side are you on in the Jefferson-Hamilton rivalry? So I've made it clear whose side I am on. Uh, got my Hamilton 1800 shirt on here, but uh, what do you think? What do you think about this whole situation? Who was right? Who was wrong? Uh, who went about it the right way? Who went about it the wrong way? What do you want to add to the conversation? Use the comment section below. And as always, check out the link in the description to the original content and support them as well. Thanks for watching.